guys ready to worship this morning? Let's just remember as we sing this song that God is always good through everything. Just give it all to him this morning.
Fellowship of the Rockies, I hope you're doing well. Thank you for joining us this weekend, whether you're here in person or online. We're just so thankful to be worshiping together this morning. 
My name is Eli Finley. I'm the youth pastor here at the church. We're going to continue in this time of worship as we bring our tithes and our offerings. And so if you'd like to give, there are many ways that you can do that here at the church. You can give online through our website. You can give by texting. You can give by mailing. Or there's baskets or boxes in the back of this room or the theater as well if you'd like to give that way. Um, But I also want to pray for you this weekend. Um, I want to pray a psalm over you. And so wherever you're at right now, whatever it is that you're doing, whether you're joining us online, you're here in person, whatever's going on in your life, whatever is going on in your head, let's take this moment to calm ourselves, to slow down, to focus on what God has for us this weekend and moving forward. Let me pray this psalm over you. So just bow your heads, close your eyes, extend a hand if you'd like. Psalm chapter 33, verses 20 through 22. It says, we wait for Yahweh. He is our help and our shield. For our hearts rejoice in him. We rejoice in you this weekend, God. We rejoice in you. And because of that, because we trust in his holy name, God, we trust in your holy name. May your faithful love rest on us, Yahweh, for we put our hope in you. God, rest on us this weekend. God, rest on us as we worship you, God. We bring you glory. We exhort you. We exalt you. Father, you are worthy of our praise when there is nothing certain to stand on here in these days, God. You are certainty. We can trust you. You are sovereign. You are in control. Father, we love you and we trust you. It's in your holy and precious name we pray. Amen.
God, we thank you for your love. We thank you that no matter where we're standing or what we're facing, that your love is constant. God, we love you and we trust you. We just ask you that you open our hearts and you open our minds to hear from you today. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Hey, Easter's coming. Easter's coming, yeah! Easter's coming. Easter's coming. Easter's coming. Easter's coming. Easter is coming! Easter is coming! We are so excited to be celebrating Easter here at Fellowship this year. We'll have four services, Saturday at 5 p.m., Sunday at 9 a.m., 10.30, and 12 noon. We're also opening up our children's ministry for pre-K through fourth grades. We can't wait to see you in person and online as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and we take in communion together. We'll see you then! Well, hey there, everyone. My name's Brady. Welcome to Fellowship of the Rockies, and thanks for spending part of your weekend with us. Before this weekend's message, we'd like to take a few minutes and tell you about some things coming up for you and your family around Fellowship. So check this out. Two of our new series start this coming week. There's still time to register for The Truth Project and Love and Respect before they start this Wednesday. We're also going to be offering an online option for those who are not able to attend in person. You will still be able to participate in the group chat and discussions with those who are attending in person. Both the online and in-person registrations are available now on our website. We're partnering with Cooperative Care Center for a food drive to support our community. You can drop off non-perishable food items during weekend services starting now through April 11th or during the week from 9 a.m. till 5 p.m. Monday through Thursday at the church office. We're so glad to see you here this weekend. For more information on any events or ministries, please visit our website. It's fellowshipoftherockies.org or check out the info desk in the foyer. Have a great week. Here's Pastor Charlie with a message. Hey everybody, how are ya? <laughs> you guys don't even sound awake. <laughs> hey, I don't know if you've heard, Easter's coming. So how's that? So, uh, so we're, we're excited about Easter this year. Um, it's been since 2009 that we've, uh, since we've been in this building for, our, for an Easter service. And so um, it's been a long time and this time we, we can't go anywhere else. Uh, because of some COVID restrictions and some things like that. And so we have four services Saturday night at 5 and then, then three on Sunday, 9, 10, 30, and noon. And so I would just encourage you that if your schedule allows and you are able to, uh, come to the noon, if you will. The service is going to be a little bit over an hour, hour, an hour, and five minutes, so you can pr plan lunch accordingly. Uh, more than likely, that would be our least attended service, and so that would help free up some space into some of the more popular services, whether it's a Saturday night or the Sunday at 9 or 10.30. And so, so if, if it works for you, um, we would love to have you at the, at the noon service. We're also going to take communion, which is another first here. I don't think we've ever taken communion on an Easter uh, Sunday and, or an Easter weekend since we're doing Saturday night. And so we're taking communion as well. We have some other things planned for you. And so we're just looking forward. Uh, last year, of course, we were online only in Easter and we didn't have a chance to gather. And so this year uh, we get to gather and we're going to celebrate and, and, uh, and worship together and then take communion. So if you have your Bibles, electronic devices, I we invite you to click to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. We're we'll going to look at 12 verses a day, one, verse 1 all the way through verse 12. And, and I counted this morning, and I cannot believe this, we've been in 2 Corinthians for 17 weeks now. Uh, we've been walking through the book of 2 Corinthians, and it's amazing the number of principles that we can lift out of the scriptures of, of, of 2 Corinthians and then apply directly into our season and directly into what we're walking through. And so 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 12 is what we're going to look at today. I've entitled this message, Dealing with Criticism, because this is what Paul deals with. And Paul begins dealing with this issue of criticism and how destructive it is to the church, how destructive it is to the body of Christ, how destructive it is to families. And it begins dealing with this issue of criticism. Now listen, let me tell you something. As a pastor, 
I mean, I'm navigating like, like you are uh, through a pandemic, and I have, I have never seen another time in, 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 in my very short life, I've never seen another time in life when it seems like people are becoming more and more angry, and people are more and more critical, people are more and more divisive, and, it, and I just got to tell you, the polarization of America is exhausting. I mean, it's just exhausting. And then when it seeps into the church or when it seeps into families, it can be just totally exhausting. It can be totally difficult to deal with. It seems like in the times in which we live, people are willing to criticize one another and no longer be able to have like civil discourse and some of those other things walking through. And so that's, that's one of the reasons why when we went in this time together, we developed the Fellowship Five to where we come to the place and, and, and have these principles, five principles that we're going to lead through, guide through during a pandemic. And so one of them was we're just going to extend grace to one another and we're going to understand what it means just to simply extend grace to one another. And just a little bit of a story about that is this, this last week. The uh, fact is, it was last Sunday of the 1030 service. I accidentally left my iPad. I didn't put it in airplane mode. And I have to put it in airplane mode because I got a bunch of immature friends that think it's fun to text me while I'm preaching. And if, if I don't put it in air, air, airplane mode, there's no telling what I'm going to see a come across my, my iPad. And so they think it's funny if it makes me laugh or I'm easily distracted and some of those other things. Well, the 1030 service, I forgot to put it in airplane mode. My wife sends me a text during the service while I'm preaching. And she says, hey, by the way, I just made you an appointment to get your vaccine shot at Walmart Thursday. Gave me the time. And then she put dot, dot, dot. By the way, I'm still not eligible yet. <laughs> just wanted to let me know that she's not old enough to get the vaccine yet. And so I'm like, and I'm preaching. I'm like, well, that's funny. You know, like, really, really? You're going to remind me of that? And so I, I, I went to Walmart and picked up a loaf of bread, got on a milk, and got a shot. <laughs> That's just funny to me. But anyway, probably not funny to you. You're half asleep. And so, and, so, and so I picked up. I got a vaccine shot. I came back. And so I, I started having some conversations with a, friend, a couple of friends. And one, I told a friend, I said, yeah, I got the vaccine shot today. And this friend tells me on the phone, he said, well, whatever you do, don't tell. Be careful who you tell. I'm like, be careful who I tell. He goes, yeah, you better be careful who you tell. I'm like, what do you mean be careful who I tell? He goes, there are some Christians that you're going to tell that you got a, a vaccine shot, and they're going to question your faith. They're going to think you're not trusting God, that you don't believe in God, and they're going to question your faith. I says, you got to be kidding me. He goes, no. Some people tie your view of mask or your view of, of a vaccine to like your Christian faith. And it's like you're not trusting God. It's like you're not walking in faith. And I say, you got to be kidding me. I had another phone call the next day. And I'm talking to a, a, a pastor friend, uh, not in our area. And so I told him that I got the shot. And he goes, well, I got the shot too. He says, are you going to tell your church? And I said, absolutely, I'm going to tell my church. Are you going to tell your church? He goes, no. He said, why would I want to do that? There, there's some people that will question my faith. We're living in a time, and see, this is, this is Paul's issue in Corinthians. In, 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 in the book of Corinthians and in Corinth, this is Paul's issue. And he begins talking about this issue of criticism. He begins talking about uh, constructive criticism and non-constructive criticism. He uses different terms. He says criticism for the building up rather than the tearing down. You understand there's two types of criticism, right? One is for the building up. I mean, there's healthy criticism. We need to understand that. That is someone that loves us and cares for us. They want the best for us. Our elders do that for me. There's occasions that, that they'll talk to me and say, these are, these are your strengths. These are some areas that you're doing well in. These are some areas that you, wanna, you may want to look at. You may want to pay particular attention to this. And so it's constructive criticism. I listen to that because I know that it's for the building up of me. It's the building up of our church. And it's healthy criticism. It's constructive criticism. But also, there's a criticism that is not constructive. There's a criticism for the tearing down. There's a criticism for this issue. And usually, listen, usually, usually it's to tear down. Usually it's to hurt. Usually you don't hear it directly. Usually there's not a lot of facts to it. It really serves no positive pressure, or no positive pressure, no positive purpose at all in your life. And so, in, but regardless, whether it's constructive or not constructive, we need to deal with it. 
appropriately. I'm learning this in life, and maybe you're learning this in your Christian life. It's easier to act like a Christian than to react like a Christian. It's easier to act like a Christian than to respond like a Christian. It's easier to live life and go through the motions. You just kind of act like a Christian than it is to react like a Christian when someone slanders you, when someone criticizes you, when someone hurts you, or when you go through difficult situations in life. And this is Paul's point. Paul's point is this, and he just goes through this, and we're going to see this several different ways as we just look at this. And, and I hope at the close of this message you understand criticism and you understand why it bothers us so much and why it's so difficult to navigate through, especially in the times in which we live. And so I want to give you four things to remember about this issue of criticism. Uh, when you face criticism or when you deal with that or how you build up or tear down another with your words, because words matter. There are some people that are they're carrying words around that someone spoke into the life or said over them years ago, and it's still affecting them. It's still hurting them. So four things to remember about this issue of criticism. When criticism comes, don't be shocked. That may be obvious, but it's in Scripture. And for some reason, a lot of us, that when criticism comes, a lot of times we're shocked, especially by who it comes from. We're going to understand that. We're going to see that in Scripture. But when criticism comes, do not be shocked. We're human. And sometimes we live in the flesh, and people around us live in the flesh. I am convinced that if some Christians were alive when Jesus fed the 5,000, they would have been upset, and they would have criticized Jesus because there was no lemon for their, their fish, and there was no butter for their bread. And they missed the miracle. Listen, I'm telling you, when you are focused in on the criticism of others, when you are focused in, even the criticism of God, but when you are focused in on that, you will miss the miracles that are going on around you. You will miss God's presence. You will miss what God is doing. And Paul is reminded us, watch this, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. Here's what Paul says. He says, now I, Paul, myself, appeal to you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. I who am humble among you in person, but, to, but bold towards you uh, when absent. So here's what's happening. There are rumors going around. There's a group of people that are criticizing Paul, and they're criticizing Paul and says, well, you know that, Paul? Paul is really, really bold when he emails us. He is really, really bold when he sent 1 Corinthians and, and 2 Corinthians, though we haven't found it, uh, 3 Corinthians. And so there's actually three letters to, to Corinth. And he's like, Paul is really bold when he sends those letters, but you know what? Face to face, he's not. You know what they were calling Paul? They are calling Paul a coward. Yeah, you're one way when you email us. You're bold when you're hiding behind a keyboard. But face to face, when you look us in the eyes, you're not going to tell us these things. And they're calling Paul like, like, like a, cow, and a coward. And it seems like when you look at this, Paul's not even shocked. Paul's like, well, you know what? I, I am meek and gentle. Please, 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 when I see you face to face, don't force me to be a little bit more bold. Let's just have a conversation. I, I don't know if you, you remember how, how the church was birthed in Corinth. It's an interesting story that plays into this. Paul was in Athens. He was a church planter. Paul's in Athens. He, God leads him. He goes down to Corinth. He rolls into Corinth, and, and he's trying to get a church planting team together. And he meets a power couple by the name of Priscilla and Aquila. It's, it's, it's important, the, 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 the word choice here, and that Priscilla's name became before Aquila. They were husband and wife. And normally, it was always the man's name that was first. In this case, with, with Priscilla, her name was always first, except for one place in Scripture. Everywhere else, her name came first because she was a the, she. She was a powerhouse. I mean, she was, she was a theological person, and she served in leadership alongside of Paul. They, they shared in a, a profession. Priscilla and Aquila were tent makers like Paul. They were Jewish believers. They were Jewish Christians, and they became a part of the church planting team. And, a, and, and Priscilla was like this. She helped disciple, and she served along. Fact is, in Romans chapter 16, verse 3, Paul simply says he remembers Priscilla and Aquila, and he says they were willing to risk his life for them. They were willing to risk his life 
Uh, they were willing to risk their life for him. They were willing to risk their life for the church, and they were co-workers. So he looked at Priscilla, he looked at, co- at, at Aquila as, as co-workers and leaders in the local church. And then Timothy and Silas show up, and Timothy and Silas are there. Now they have a church planting team. They start birthing the church in Corinth, and then all of a sudden there's controversy. People started criticizing Paul harshly, and so he moves to a better location. He moves right up against the, 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 the synagogue in Corinth. And he's right up against the synagogue. And you can read it for yourself in Acts chapter 18. And, he, and, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, he leads the, the ruler of the synagogue to, to Christianity. This man changes. And Corinth gets upset. I mean, the wheels come off. And Paul one night is praying and he's thinking, do I need to leave? I mean, is this, is this just going to go south? Do I need to lead what I need? And then God speaks to him in a vision. This is so fascinating. Here's what God says. Acts chapter 18, 9 and 10. He says, the Lord said to Paul in, Paul in a night vision, do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Don't, don't be silent. And there's some promises. For I am with you. No one will lay a hand on you to hurt you because I have many people in this, in this city. So, so here's, what, here's what God's telling Paul. Paul, whatever you do. Don't back down. Whatever you do, you keep on speaking. Whatever, they're, they're going to criticize you because, you know, right? You know, we all know this. When someone slanders us, when someone criticizes us, when someone talks down to us, if we're not careful when we're around them, we'll become silent of the truth because we just don't want to be criticized anymore. And so Paul is saying, or God is telling Paul, Paul, whatever you do, do not become silent. They are going to criticize you. They are going to spread rumors about you. They're going to slander you. But do not be silent. Good news, they're not going to hit you. (laughs) How's that for starting a church? Uh, They're going to criticize you. They're going to talk about you. But I'm not going to let them hit you. I'm not going to let them abuse you. I'm not going to let them beat you. And then he makes an interesting statement. He says, and and please remember, I have many people in this city. And in other words, many people in this city are mine. They're believers. Because here's what happens when people begin to criticize you. If you and I are not careful, who do we focus on? We focus on the ones who are against us and not for us. We focus on the one who are criticizing us and talking about us. And we, we forget that there are other people that support us. There are other people that actually love us. There are other people that actually care about us. And so this group of people, they're attacking Paul. And they're accusing him of being a coward. And they're saying, hey, face to face, you're just not bold. Criticism, listen, criticism is a part of life. And we just might as well get used to it. Paul was one of the greatest men in history. If you just count words, he wrote more of the New Testament. In fact, it's just word count. He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. Planted churches. Started a movement. I mean, Paul was willing to, be, to suffer for his faith, to be beaten for his faith, to be jailed for his faith. He would just pick himself up and go to the next city. I mean, this man was like bold, and yet they're criticizing him. They're criticizing him for a questionable past. They're criticizing him for strong authority. They're criticizing him and saying he really wasn't a, an apostle. It was something that he, it was hard to prove. And they were criticizing him because some believed that he wanted their money. They were criticizing him because of the inconsistent personality. They're criticizing him because he's a coward. And then watch what he, what, what, verse 10 in, in 2 Corinthians. For it is said. That's an interesting phrase because here's what happens. When people criticize you, they will always say, well, you know what everybody's saying. Everybody thinks. Because they always travel in numbers. They always travel in packs. And so he goes on. He says, for it is said. His letters are weighty and powerful. And watch this. Now all of a sudden it gets very personal. But his physical presence is weak. In case we don't understand that. Just so we're all tracking this morning, they're calling him ugly. Weak, physical of presence. Paul, more than likely, and theologians debate about this all the time, he, he, probably, was a, he probably had a hunchback. He, he may have had a physical deformity. Um, and so he wasn't, he wasn't easy to look at. And so they said, but his physical appearance is weak, and his public speaking, oh my word, amounts to nothing. Now they get personal. Paul, it's hard to look at you and listen to you for 30 minutes a week. 
Paul, we just need to let you know. You're not very attractive and, oh, this this preaching gift that you think you have. We just want to let you know you're preaching. It it literally amounts to nothing. Three factors this morning, because I I think this is so important for us just to rest here so that you understand this. Three factors that I, I jotted down, and I'll show you some scripture. The reason that criticism in life is just so hard, it is just so hard to take. Criticism is difficult when we're criticized in areas of our weakness. Isn't that true? Criticism is difficult when we know it's an area that we already struggle in. We know it's an area of our past that we may have some guilt over. We may have some shame over. We may have some hurt over. We, it's hard to take when it's an area of our life that we know that, you know what, that it, man, I'm trying to get better. I'm just trying to get better. If, if they had accused Paul of not being very intelligent, are not lacking zeal or love for the Lord, then he could have brushed that off, right? Because, I mean, he was educated. I mean, he went to the seminary that you want to go to. Nobody was educated more than Paul. Um, I, mean, I mean, he goes through his, his, his resume, and it's like impeccable. And so if he had been criticized in an area that it was a strength, it would have been out easy for him to brush, up, brush it off. But the truth is, Paul lacked charisma. He wasn't a good orator. He wasn't polished. And, and in their day, listen, in their day in Corinth, a lot like in our day and a lot like in our culture, people would flock to see people in, 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 in sports or entertainment or some er- other areas that had unbelievable gifts on the platform, unbelievable speaking gifts, unbelievable singing gifts and some of those other things. And they didn't care about the character. They, didn't, they would follow them. They didn't care about their character. They didn't care about their lifestyle. They may be willing to watch some reality shows so they know all about it. But they didn't care about their character. The same was true in Corinth as is now. And Paul, Paul struggled in these areas. And Paul tried to help them and says, you must misunderstand this issue of preaching. Preaching is just not stringing some Christian words together. Anybody can do that. It is deeper than that. You miss what real preaching is. And so he goes on all the way back in 1 Corinthians, because here's the interesting thing about this issue of criticism. When you look at 2 Corinthians, Paul never changed their mind. Regardless of the number of conversations he had with them, regardless of the the number of times he told them, this is what God's led me, this is what I'm doing, they they never agreed. They never agreed with him. And all the way back in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17, Paul's talking about this. He said, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. It's just so we're tracking, he says, not with eloquent wisdom, so that the cross of Christ will be emptied of its effect. And then, then, then in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 1 through 5, he says, when I came to you, brothers and sisters, announcing the mystery of God to you, I did not come with brilliance of speech or wisdom. I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness, fear, and in much trembling. My speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith may not rest, so that your faith may not be based on human wisdom, but on God's power. And he's trying to help them understand that that's preaching. Preaching is something that the Holy Spirit joins with us. And it's a demonstration of the power of God that changes lives, that changes souls, changes the eternal destiny of people. But it did not matter what Paul told them. They weren't going to change their mind. Criticism, listen, criticism is hard to take when we already have a weakness in that area. If you feel guilty over how you parented, if you made some bad decisions or whatever and, and you've changed and all those other things, but yet you have a child, adult, ch- adult child, a spouse or someone and makes a critical comment about that, it can cut you to the core because it's an area that you already feel weak in. It's an area that you already, if you feel like you failed in business, you failed in an area and someone makes a critical comment and it ties in to a past, it ties in, it's hard to take when you can't brush it off. The second thing is this, criticism is harder to take when there's a dash of truth in it, and when it's hard to prove, sometimes that's the most difficult stuff to walk through in criticism. When it's just, it's just hard to prove. It's just hard to prove. And, and, and it's true. Paul had a questionable past, right? He felt guilty that he persecuted Christians before he, before he, beca- before he became a Christian. He, he was called an apostle in kind of questionable circumstances that he really couldn't 
he really couldn't prove. I mean, it was a mystery of God. And, and, and th- then he was taking up an offering, right? One other thing that they criticized him, you know, he was taking up an offering. He had pure motives, and they questioned his motives. That's sometimes when criticizing, criticism can become paralyzing. When someone begins questioning the motives of another, how do you prove that? And it's true. It's absolutely true. Paul wasn't a great speaker, and, and it, it was in a day and time before they had the scriptures, right? I mean, we have all the scriptures. We can see that his, his preaching did change lives and was powerful, but for them, it was hard for Paul. It was just hard for Paul to prove, and, and that's kind of subjective, right, on a human level, whether it changes lives or whether it's not. Here's another thing about criticism. Criticism is d- difficult to take when it comes from Christian people. That's what my friends were talking about. Criticism is hard to take. When it comes from Christian people, it, 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 it's one thing when the world finds fault. We kind of expect that. But when brothers and sisters in Christ and fellow Christians begin criticizing and question each other's faith and question each other's beliefs and Paul's now under attack from the church that he started. Many of these people came to faith in, under his ministry. And, and Paul knew the scriptures right. Paul knew that Jesus was criticized, criticized his entire ministry. And oh, and the people that criticized him were the religious. They criticized him of blasphemy. They criticized him of being demonic. They criticized him of being an illegitimate child. And, and, and Paul understood that criticism is part of life. And, and look, I just want you to see this verse 7, and then we'll move on because we need to move quickly. Um, you guys aren't listening fast enough. That's what you're doing. <laughs> oh, that sounded critical. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 7, here's what Paul says. He says, look at what is obvious. If anyone is confident that he belongs to Christ, let him remind himself of this. Just as he belongs to Christ, so do we. It's a powerful statement. I I could preach a whole message on that. Hey, guys, could we just remember we're in the family? Could we just remember we're brothers and sisters in Christ? Could we just remember we're in this together? Can we just quit all this? Can we quit all this before we destroy everything? The second thing about this is is about criticism is this, is, is when criticism comes, refuse to retaliate. I mean, just, I, I am telling you, it is easier to act like a Christian than to react like a Christian. It is easier to, to, to live like a Christian than to react like a Christian when you've been criticized, right? Because there's something about the flesh. We just want to retaliate. We just want to prove that, you know what, we're right and you're wrong. And so you look at this, and in and, and verse 3 and 4, Paul says, For although we live in the flesh, guess what? We do not wage war according to the flesh. Since the wep- weapons of warfare are not of the flesh, but are powerful... Uh, through God for the, for the demoli- demolition of strongholds, we demolish arguments. So here's what Paul's saying. Guess what? As believers, we no, no, no longer live in the flesh. We don't fight with fleshly weapons. The world uses the flesh. The world uses violence and criticism and sarcasm and, and deception and trickery and, and slander and question each other's motives and all of those other things. And, but, but we're not like that. We're no longer of the flesh. You know what? We're of the spirit. And so retaliation is this issue of trying to defend one's right or proving someone's self-worth. And, and when you look at this, when criticism comes, you have to refuse to retaliate because there's many people that think, you know what? I'll just retaliate and I'll, 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 fi- I'll feel better. And you may for a short time, but then the spirit of God's going to deal with you. I mean, you may feel good when you hit sand You may feel good when you send that text message. You may feel good immediately as you say those words, but then the Spirit of God is going to deal with you. And here's the interesting thing to me about Paul. In the midst of this, he still wants the best for them. In the midst of this, I mean, they are criticizing him. And he rises above it. There's there's a principle that I wrote in my, like, my, my study Bible. You know, it's old school Bible and and because I'm I'm still study that way and in the margin of this Bible I I wrote just this principle stay above the fray or you'll become the prey I mean if you if you get down in that level and you begin to retaliate and you begin to fight with worldly weapons man it will destroy you and when you look at Paul Paul is like he's staying above the fray 
because he doesn't want to become the prey. He understands the goal. And even though they're criticizing him, he doesn't even retaliate. He just reminds, in fact, he is in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13. This is like just free. We've been life journaling through it. Paul deals with this again. And he says, hey, when we're reviled, we're Christians. We bless. When we're persecuted, we endure. When we're slandered, we respond graciously. I mean, he's trying to help them understand, don't, listen, don't retaliate. And Paul, Paul knew, watch this, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. And I'm, I'm going to give you one tidbit that's free, and I know i got to hurry. But 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, watch this. And every proud thing that is raised up. So here's what, criticism, what, what happens with criticism. Criticism that, that is meant to tear down, that is meant to hurt, is, is comes out of this issue of pride. In other words, I'm going to p- compare you to myself. You, you need to become more like me. And so that's why he uses this word. And every proud thing that is raised up against the knowledge of God, we take every thought. Now he's talking about thought, okay? This is important. We take every thought captive to obey Christ. And we are ready to punish any disobedience once our disobedience is complete. So here's what's for free. I am tell a Saturday night group this. You and I have to learn to deal with our inner critic. That's what Paul's talking about. We take every thought captive. We make sure it lines up with the cross. It's obedient to the cross. Because I'm telling you. If you don't deal with your inner critic, because isn't it true? You don't have to raise your hand, don't respond, don't flinch, just look straight ahead, don't nudge anyone, nothing, don't move. Isn't it true our inner critic can be the worst critic of all? If we're honest. Your inner critic, my inner critic, expects perfection. I should know all the answers. I should know how to respond. I should do everything perfectly. I should never make a mistake. I should never sin. I should have never let that happen. You have your list. I have mine, right? There's only one person that I know that was perfect. And his name is Jesus Christ. And he was perfect. Why do you think you're going to be perfect? Why, Why do you think that we can be perfect? If, listen, if you don't destroy your inner critic, when there's an outer critic that speaks in, and now you have an outer critic and an inner critic, it will destroy you. That's why Paul's saying, you know what we got to do? We got to take every thought captive, the inner critic, to obey Christ. And we're ready to punish any disobedience, and any obedience is complete. Here's the third thing. When criticism comes, we, we have to know when to respond. I, I, really, I really believe this. 99, 90, 99% of criticism, we should just ignore. We should just, like, move on. I believe most should be ignored than responded to. Nehemiah did this. One of my favorite chapters or books of the Bible, the Old Testament, is Nehemiah. Nehemiah goes back to Jerusalem. He begins rebuilding the wall. There's three guys that did not want the wall rebuilt. So these three guys are angry. They criticized, listen, they criticized Nehemiah all the way through the project and said it's never going to happen, it's never going to work. Even when it happened and even when it was dedicated, they were still criticizing him. Even even when it was proved out they were wrong, they didn't change their mind. And so so look at a couple of verses about how Nehemiah responded to this. Nehemiah 4 verse 3, it says, Then Tobiah, so he's one of the three, the Ammonite, who was beside him, said, Indeed, even if a fox climbed up, what they were building, he would, break down, he would break down their stone. And so five times he made this statement. And five times Nehemiah um, kind of responded back and says, I can't come down and talk to you. Uh, what I'm doing is too great. I'm doing something from the Lord and, or for the Lord. And so he wasn't going to focus on his, his critics. And, and then in chapter 6, verse 8, they got like halfway done. So we rebuilt the wall until the entire wall was joined together up to half its height. And isn't it true that when you get halfway through a project, that's when it's really difficult to finish? (laughs) I can't tell you how many halfway projects I have. I mean, it's something about doing a project. And so that's the time that if you're going to cave, you're going to cave when it gets halfway done. 
And so they're at that age. And for the, the people had the will to keep working. Again, they come back and they criticize him. He says, I, I, I can't come down off the wall. I'm doing too great of a, um, too great of a work. And, and all of a sudden you see when Nehemiah responded to them and when Paul responds to the critics is when you have to respond to the critics is when it's threatening the integrity of an organization, the integrity of an individual, a person, a ministry, or whatever. Verse 11, here's how Paul answers that. He says, let such a person consider this, what we are in our letters when we're absent, we will also be in our actions when we're present. So that's just like a simple statement. He is not slandering them. He's not, even though they were questioning his faith, he wasn't questioning their faith. Even though they were questioning his leadership, he wasn't questioning theirs. It was just a statement, verse 12. For we don't dare classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. Now he's talking about pride. But in measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves to themselves, I just need to let you know they lack understanding. Paul's saying, you know what your problem is? Your problem is comparisons. You're, you're comparing me to you. What you're really saying is you just want me to be you. What you're really saying is an expression of faith is how you live your life. And so as a result of that, you're comparing me to you. That is always destructive criticism. See, criticism constructive criticism in your life doesn't compare you to another person. It compares you to God. It compares you to the scriptures. The scriptures should drive us. And Paul is saying, you, you, don't, you don't understand what faith is. You don't, you don't understand what it means to, to trust in, 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 in the Lord. And have you ever noticed a lot of times when people criticize you, they're criticizing you. They're comparing, they're comparing their perceived strength to your perceived weakness. And this is what Paul's talking about. Listen, can I just tell you, finding approval in people will never cause you to love God more. Paul got this. Paul understood that. This is why the scripture says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Oh, and love your neighbor as yourself because the more you love God, the more you're going to love people. I'm telling you, if, if, if you need approval of people, if you need approval of people to feel better about yourself, it keeps you so self-focused, you'll never be able to focus on, on God. And we all struggle with this, right? I can preach a message on criticism and still in the back of my mind concerned if someone's going to criticize me for the sermon I just preached on criticism. I mean, it's an odd thing, right? We all deal with it if we're just honest. The fourth and last thing is this. When criticism comes, just remember the goal. That's what God's telling Paul in Acts chapter 18. Hey, Paul, I need to let you know. They're going to they're gonna criticize you, but I'm not going to let them hit you. Just remember the goal. Just remember I have plenty of people in this city that are for you. I have plenty of people in this city that are mine. Verse 8, he goes, For if I boast a little too much about our authority, which the Lord gave for the building you up and not for the tearing down, I will not be put to shame. That's a strong statement. I'm not going to allow you to put me to shame. I'm not going to allow you to give me guilt because you're criticizing me about some stuff. I mean, you, Paul was saying if your self-esteem is, is found in God, then guess what? You'll remember the goal. If it's found in the approval of people, you'll become silent. You'll just quit speaking truth. That's what, Paul, that's what God was telling Paul when he launched the church. Verse 9, he says, I don't want to seem as though I'm trying to terrify you with my letters. For it is said, his letters are weighty and powerful, but his physical presence is weak. His public speaking amounts to nothing. Can you imagine how hurtful that was for Paul like to put that on paper? Let such a person consider this. What we are in our letters, we, when we are absent, we will be in our actions when we are present. For we don't classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. But in measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves to themselves... They lack understanding. And Paul said there's just, there's just a couple of traps in here. Commending yourself, this issue of pride. In other words, you live your life and you brag to try to impress others. And, and Paul says that's a trap. And he also said a, another trap is com, co, comparing ourselves to others. He says measuring themselves by one another, compare themselves with one another. They are without understanding. And so Paul is coming to this place and says, hey, if your goal is to please people and you're always worried what people are going to think and if they're gonna, you're going to live a miserable life. 
And you're not going to know the freedom in Christ. You're not going to know his peace. And you're going to be constantly vulnerable. You're going to be vulnerable to criticism. You're going to allow people to control you because how they criticize you. And Paul is saying if someone criticizes you, you need to evaluate it. And you need to just determine it. And then if, then if you're doing what God has called you to do, then like move on. If you line up with the scriptures, then, then move on. And then watch this, 2 Corinthians 10, 13. He says, we, however, will not boast beyond measure, but according to the measure of the area of ministry that God has assigned us. So he understood the area that God has assigned him, which reaches even to you. You know, he's, talk, he's telling them, my goal is the gospel. My goal is not to impress people. My goal is not to impress people on the platform. My goal is to preach the gospel and help people to understand that you can have eternal life. You can have forgiveness of sin. That the crucified Christ, the resurrected one, came. He lived a perfect and sinless life. He was crucified for your sins and for my sins. And on the third day, he rose again. And as a result of that, we can have forgiveness of sin. We can live life not in the flesh, but in the spirit. And we no longer wage war in the flesh. We wage war in the spirit, which is this issue of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. Against such thing, there is no law. And I am here to set you free. I am here to help you understand what it means to live in freedom. And Paul, Paul never backed away from that goal. Paul never became silent. Because whoever was criticizing him, whoever was talking about him, because he knew that the goal meant the eternal destiny of people. Would you bow your heads with me and close your eyes? With your heads bowed and eyes closed, let me ask you, what is God saying to you? What is God saying to you as a result of this message? Maybe for you, you've never accepted Christ. You've never come to that place to where you've asked him to come into your life for the forgiveness of your sins. And maybe this morning, maybe you would do that. And maybe you would ask him, dear Lord Jesus, I know my sins have separated me from you. And I ask that you come into my life, you forgive me of my sins, and you give me the gift of eternal life. And that would be your first step. But maybe you've done that. And maybe, maybe, you, need to, maybe you need to come to the place and say, God, what are you saying to me as a result of this message? More importantly, what is my next step? What is my next step? Every one of us has a next step. Are there some people around you that are criticizing you and it is destroying you? And you just need to realize who you are in Christ and what he has done for you. Or maybe, maybe you've been unfairly criticizing some others. And you need to understand what it means to build others up and not tear them down. Just a minute, I'm going to pray, and after I pray, we're going to stand. And if you need prayer in any area of your life for any reason, I'm just going to invite you that as we stand up, would you step out and begin making your way down to the front. And we'd just love to have the honor of praying for you. If you're carrying a burden, if you have a prayer request, a need in your life, then we would love to pray for you. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you. We thank you for today. Father, we thank you for your love and your grace. We thank you for the power of your name. And, Lord, we just ask that you just pull this church very closely to you. And that, Lord, we would respond to you. And that burdens would be lifted, prayers would be answered. We'd add our faith to each other's faith. And so, Lord, we just look forward to see what you're going to do. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand with me? And as you stand, as you stand up, would you step out, begin making your way down to the front? We would love to have our opportunity to pray for you. If you're here this morning and you're carrying a burden, it can be a financial issue, a relational issue. It can be a medical issue. You may want to pray for a friend. You may want to come as an individual or as a family. But if you need prayer in any of your life, we have prayer partners down here. And we'd love to have the opportunity to pray for you. We'd love to have the opportunity to encourage you. So you just come. You make your way down the front. We'll guide you. We'll direct you. If you're watching online or if you're viewing this on demand, there's several ways you can do this. If you're watching on li live, you can click live prayer. Prayer partner will actually meet you in a, in, a, in, a, in a virtual room. If this is on demand, just click connect card. Fill that out and we'll get in touch with you. We'd love to help you. If you're here this morning and you've made a decision, there's several ways that you can do that. There's a QR code on the seat back in front of you. Just use your smartphone. Uh, and the connect card will come up. You can fill that out electronically, and that goes to us. 
Or if you're old school and prefer, would prefer to do it with pen and paper, then we have an information booth out in the foyer. We'd love to help you with that. We're so glad you're here this morning. As people are still making their way down to the front, if you need prayer in any area of your life, you just keep coming. The scripture says this, and we're just going to use this as our benediction. And we've been using this as a benediction for, for several weeks now. The early church, for the, for the forming of the church, the first 200 years of the church, they would use this scripture out of Jude as a benediction. And so this morning, may you just receive this as a word from the Lord. And here's what the scripture says. Now to him who is able to protect you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory without blemish, with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time, now and forever and ever. Amen. May you know the peace of Christ this week. God bless you. May you have a great weekend.